Hello, and welcome to the Field Guides. I'm Steve, and I'm here with Bill. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Steve. What we're going to do today, and over the course of many future episodes, is give you the experience of what it's like to be out in the field, in the woods, and on the trail. For every episode, lately Bill picks a natural history topic, <laughs> <laughs> researches the science on that topic, tells me to meet him out in a natural area somewhere, and shares with you everything he learned. So Bill, do you want to tell us what today's episode is going to be about? Because you did tell me, but I can't remember. <laughs> That's all right. Today's episode is going to be on vocal mimicry, mostly in birds. Oh, I do remember now. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did tell you what the episode topic would be on a trip we recently took for the podcast. Mm-hmm. But we're going to tell the audience about that at the end of the episode. Okay, so yeah. stick around for a special announcement about our next episode. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Yeah. Now, we'll get to that topic in just a minute, but... I always try to remember to give people an idea of where we are. And this is a site where we've recorded quite a number of episodes. This is Chestnut Ridge Park. This is a county park about 20 minutes southeast of Buffalo. If we had a view to the, what, the northwest, we would be able to see the city of Buffalo and Lake Erie. <laughs> uh. And we are in a fairly heavily trafficked part of the park, so we may hear runners and hikers going by. Mm -hmm. But we are in a second growth forest. We're right now walking along gorge yeah uh, not yeah. a huge gorge a there's a oh. <laughs> creek down there we're passing maples we're passing beach. beaches yeah yeah typical second growth forest mm -hmm. pretty decent understory here well it's mostly ferns witch we hazel, are here right? yeah there's yeah. witch hazel there star of a past episode <laughs> and we are here in late july yeah 2022 so you can hear the cicadas chattering overhead we mm -hmm. got some red eyed red eyed vireos oh, yeah. uh, calling from the treetops and it is very very dry we had rain a couple days ago but that's the first rain we've had in quite a while yeah i was just telling bill it, it's been nice and since i'm a i've owned a house for about a year now it's been nice i haven't had to cut my grass in like a month because it's been so dry it yeah. just doesn't want to grow <laughs> it was weird to hear you complain that your, your lawn was yellow <laughs> right you know and then now you I, care about those <laughs> right right it, but it made me feel a little better because a lot of my neighbors have the same thing and at the university it's all the same story so <laughs> all right well we're going to start today's topic by actually doing something a little different i'm going to play an audio clip oh the last time we played an audio clip at the beginning of the episode was <laughs> poke the poke <laughs> yes <laughs> love that one all right so this one i just want you to listen to it and see if you can tell what is being said in this clip all right okay can you make it out okay it it was a very mumbled i almost like Get over here. Hey, 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 hey. So they're, listen again. They're saying okay. hello there at the beginning, oh, right? okay. Hello. All right, listen. Hello there. Hey, hey, hey. Okay. <laughs> He's going, hello there. Ay, 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 ay. Okay. Let yeah. me play one more time. Hello there. Hey, hey, hey. When you say what to listen for, that's right. what I'm hearing. But at the same time, I still hear the thing that I thought it was originally. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Now let me blow your mind. That was a harbor seal. Whoa! <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that was a harbor seal named Hoover. Do you know what's funny? You say it's a seal. I was imagining it being like a sea man or something. <laughs> well, right. hang on. You're right. Oh. Because this was a, a seal that was raised by a Maine fisherman. Wow. Okay. So he had picked up those kind of vocal inflections. Whoa. He sounds like an old Mainer saying, hello there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he ended up at the Boston Aquarium. Mm -hmm. in the 1970s and he was an attraction where people could come and hmm. listen to hoover and it's one of the few cases of a mammal mimicking the voice of a human mm, a non-human mammal <laughs> mimicking <Correct>. another human <laughs> exactly so in today's episode we're going to focus mostly on birds uh -huh. but i am going to pepper in just some of the the amazing accounts i found of mammals or other animals mimicking not just people but also sounds from the environment yeah now i want to focus with a just defining our terms. What is vocal mimicry? Mm -hmm. We're talking about when an animal learns a sound from another species or from its environment. Mm. So this is different than other animal vocalizations like when birds learn their songs or when we learn human speech. Right. Because we're learning those from members of our own species. Yeah. Right? So at this point, I want the terms conspecifics and heterospecifics. Yeah. Because heterospecifics would be other species. And I guess... Conspecifics would be their own species? Correct. Yeah. All right. So in this research, all the research I was going through, it's talking about 
mimicry. Mm -hmm. They use these terms a lot. Yeah. So, and you got it exactly right too. And I'm about to get something else exactly right. So I know why they mimic, right? I figured it out. It's sort of like why <laughs> butterflies do it. It's to make the predators that would go after them think they're poisonous. So that's so, what Hoover was doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they're well, like, no. I'm poisonous. Yeah. I'm, maybe he's saying, I'm a human, don't no, eat no. me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But totally different type of mimicry. But that, was <laughs> but that is a huge part of the research, was finding out why do animals do this? Yeah, yeah. Why do they mimic? And that's going right. to be kind of one of the big questions we're trying to answer. Yeah. And of course, what I was saying was absolute nonsense. <laughs> so. But... No. Really? <laughs> that is one of the functional hypotheses oh, about gosh. why animals do this. And I know nothing about this topic, so <laughs> not we'll with, see. Yeah. Not with Hoover, necessarily. But, <laughs> right, right. But other animals. Yeah, that's what I was saying. That, that's, <laughs> that's why the, uh, the mockingbird is singing. <laughs> so, conspecifics, just to repeat that. If I use that term, because it is kind of peppered throughout, yeah. um, conspecifics are your own species. Yeah. So when we learn to speak... We're doing that from conspecifics. We're doing that from our own species. Yeah. Unless reptilians live among us. <laughs> and then they could be teaching us language. <laughs> it might be difficult for, for reptiles. <laughs> we'll I talk about why. Reptilians, like the aliens. Oh, not... the ones that are in government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, yeah, gotcha, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, those the skin, kind of The skinwalkers or whatever they are. Are they actually reptiles? Like? I don't know what the... <laughs> <laughs> we need some DNA analysis. <laughs> right, right. Right. Someone find me a reptilian <laughs> that we could take a DNA sample from. No, we're going to, as I keep saying, we're going to focus mostly on mimicry in birds, and that's going to be in general, and we're going to look specifically at a few North American natives, including arguably the most well-known, the mockingbird, who you mm -hmm. just mentioned, the yeah. other mockingbird. All right, now an example of the accuracy and diversity of sounds, especially in birds, Mm -hmm. appeared on one of our favorite people's, one of their television series, David Attenborough. Yeah. His, his series, Lives of Birds, the mm -hmm. TV show, he talked about the male superb liar bird. I was about to say, I, I'm just picturing now, like it's, I couldn't have it stop playing in my head. It's the liar bird. Isn't that the one doing the chainsaw noise? I'm going to play that. Oh, yep, cool, yep. cool. So, and I, I had thought about putting in the clip from the TV show yeah. because I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we got a cease and desist letter from David Attenborough? <laughs> right. <laughs> that would be, I could frame that and put that Right, on. right. <laughs> so the lyrebird is endemic to Australia. It's one of the world's largest songbirds. And as you mentioned, it's, it's renowned for its mimicry ability, but it's also renowned for its elaborate tail and courtship displays. Yeah. So that's what it's, it's the main thing it seems to use its mimicry for it. The male kind of clears out an area of the forest, mm -hmm. uh, almost like a stage, and then it performs a courtship dance and display. And it incorporates up to 20 other species in its courtship songs. Wow. And as you're going to hear, it even mimics a camera shutter, a shutter with a motor drive, a car alarm, and then, as you said, a chainsaw. Wow. So let me play that for you. sounds like a regular show. That's amazing. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I'm going to put a link to the clip in the episode notes. It's even more amazing to watch the bird, yeah. like, open its beak and those sounds come out. Right. It's, it's like a ventriloquist trick. Right. <laughs> those sounds should not be coming out of, of that face. Right. <laughs> so here in North America, northern mockingbirds, Mimis polyglottus, they're among the best examples of mimics as well as other species in its family, Mimidae. And those include the brown thrasher and the gray catbird. Do you know what's funny? Because, and maybe you go through this too, where when you hear something, when we were talking about mockingbirds, I was like, oh, Mimulus polyglottos. <laughs> Mimulus is monkey flower. Oh. No, you said the right one. In my head, I was you thinking... Turned it into, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I know it's the Mimidae, but in my head, I was just quickly like, <laughs> that's what this species is. That's what the, And I was like, no, nah, it's not the multi what does polyglottos mean so multi languaged or multi speech yeah. monkey flower that's what i was thinking but <laughs> but uh, i like that cuz th that's a cool specific epithet for the scientific name right it, it, polyglottos so teach you something yeah right? polyglot yeah. yeah 
So this is, for those that don't know, Mockingbird is a medium-sized, slender songbird. There's a long tail, grayish above, whitish below, and has two white wing bars. Yeah. And when it flies, it flashes white wing patches in flight. Now, it's found throughout the lower 48 states in extreme southern Canada and down in Mexico. But here in western New York, have, have you seen it very often? So there's certain places I'll go to see it. Like, for example, we've done an episode or two at Tift Nature Preserve. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll kind of see them right outside of Tift. Like, almost when you get in, I see them a lot. But that's also another place where I'll see, like, brown th- thrashers and stuff, which, right. even though they don't look similar, they're all in the same, the Mimidae, the, the same family cat birds. We'll probably... Well, no, they're there, I'll, too. I don't want to jump ahead, because I'm sure you'll bring those guys up, too. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's kind of a cool family, because I actually had no idea that they were closely related before looking into the taxonomy. For, right, yeah, I didn't realize yeah. it either. When I looked on iNaturalist in preparing for the episode, it seemed that most of the mockingbird sightings, here in Western New York at least, are around urban areas. Oh, well, Tiff's uh, right in the middle of an urban area, basically. That makes me question, though, is it because that's where they're concentrated, or is it just because that's where there's more people looking? So it seems like, at least kind of here in New York State, yeah, they're not rare, but they're they're not as common as like chickadees or, or things oh, like yeah. that. Oh yeah, it's one of those ones that I'm always happy to see, yeah. but I don't really see it all that often. Yeah. So, as I said, they're found throughout North America, but it really seems to be concentrated most in like the the south southeast. Okay, uh, that's where they seem to be the most common. Uh, I was recently in, in Key West mm. and just walking through the streets, you would hear mockingbirds a lot oh, coming yeah. from the trees. Yeah, when I was in the Outer Banks, that's I think that's oh. where I saw the most mimids. They they were going nuts there. Like you couldn't not hear them everywhere you went and and yeah. they are very vocal their song is oh, a i thought lo- you're about to say very annoying because <laughs> they are especially when you're surrounded by like a hundred cat birds all going off that's a judgment call <laughs> <laughs> but their song it's a long series of phrases and each phrase is repeated two to six times i found it's usually repeated three to four times in a lot of the literature it mentions mm. um, before they shift to a new part of the phrase and they sing all through the day often into the night it's usually the unmated males that sing more than the mated males. We'll talk hmm. about why. And a male may have two distinct repertoires of songs. Some people say they have one for spring and another for fall, but we'll look into hmm. some of the research for that. And they continue to add new sounds to the repertoires throughout their lives. So a, a male mockingbird may learn around 200 songs throughout its life. Hmm. So wow. songs from 200 other birds, and they often mimic sounds in their environment including car alarms, creaky gates, similar to the lyrebird. So I'm going to play just a regular mockingbird song. So you might hear some familiar songs in there from other species. Okay. That sounds like a common yellow throat to me. Tikal, tikal, tikal. Or a Carolina wren. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Sounds like a blue jay, doesn't it? I thought the one before might have been a migrating turd a little bit. <laughs> and notice they were <gasps> pretty, pretty, right? Tough to tip mouse? No? Oh, so. uh, cardinal. Th- they have similar. Yeah. yeah. And notice they're repeating each phrase like three or four times, mostly. Okay, now. D- I don't know what it sounds like, but did an ivory build woodpecker? <laughs> 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 that would be an interesting data point. Yeah, we know yeah. they're around because we heard the mockingbird <laughs> doing it. <laughs> All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a tufted titmouse. Okay. And I'm going to I'm also going to play a mockingbird doing a tufted titmouse. And I want you to tell me if you can tell the difference between the two. Kinky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's a fun game. All right, so here's vocalization one. Is yeah. this the actual tuft of titmouse, or is it the mockingbird yeah. mimicking? Okay. Right? Okay, so that was vocalization one. Okay. And I think the handle for that, right? Chiva, Chiva, Chiva. Is that I've the... heard Peter, Peter, Peter. Peter, okay. Yep. Maybe I'm getting it confused with another one. Okay. I can tell that they're different. Uh-huh. One of them's like a, a lower pitch, the other one's higher pitch. The, the, the first one hurt my ears. <laughs> it's like a coin toss at this point. I'll say B. B is the mimic. Correct. I, oh, well. You're right. I, honestly, I was just as likely to be <laughs> correct as incorrect. So. Well, let's play it again. So okay. here's the here's the actual tuft of titmouse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then here's the mockingbird doing the tuft of titmouse. I should say mimicking the tuft of titmouse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... The mockingbirds, we, we call these guys mimics, but they do kind of a, a poor job of mimicking them. Yeah. It's not going to sound exactly right. 
So I have another oh, one. Oh, you say poor. I wasn't agreeing with that it was a poor copy. Because, for you know, like I said, I it's so tough. When you're hearing it side by side, maybe someone better than me could tell them <laughs> apart. But when you're just hearing the one. Well, hang on. Because maybe if I play other ones, you'll be able to okay. easily tell the difference. And we should say also that with the Tuft to Titmouse, there are going to be regional variations in their song. Okay. And so each Tuft to Titmouse, depending on where you are, is not going to sound the same. Yeah. But the birds in one area, the mockingbirds, when they're mimicking them, don't do a perfect job of mimicking them. Okay. Okay. And the only difference I could tell that time was the pitch was lower, and maybe I'm getting confused by the pitch being lower, but I thought maybe it might have been ever so slightly slower, but I don't know. The anyway. pitch was a little different. It was a little gurglier. It wasn't okay. quite exactly the same. Okay. All right. Now, this is going to be a Carolina Wren, so I don't want to confuse Steve too much, so I'm just going to go ahead and say this is the actual Carolina okay. Wren. So that's the one that sounds like TKL, TKL, TKL. Okay. And then here's the Mockingbird. Oh, again, it seems a little lower pitch. Mm -hmm. A little yeah. faster, maybe. Yeah. All right. And then we'll do one more. Here's the Phoebe, the Eastern Phoebe. And then here's the Mockingbird. I would never have been able to tell those apart. <laughs> the other one is pretty good. That was good, yeah. <laughs> So, I love the Phoebe call too, and yeah, I, that was a good. That's a good mimic. Yeah. And for people that, that don't know, it sounds a little bit like they're saying Phoebe, and yeah. there's a little burry at the end. There. Yep, that burry B. Now, B. I know right now there's people, probably birders out there listening to this, who are freaking out because we're talking about all the great things about the mockingbird. Because mm. <laughs> researching for the episode, you would have these articles about how great the mocking, mockingbird is as a mimic. Yeah. And almost every time, there'd be at least one person saying, well, actually, it's a brown thrasher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the brown thrasher can learn between one and 2,000 songs wow. of other birds. So what, what did you say, the mockingbird? 200. 200. Around 200. Wow. So the brown thrasher does seem to be able to learn <laughs> many more songs in its repertoire, depending on the individual bird. Right. And I think the mockingbird probably gets more press as this being a better mimic because... The thrasher doesn't mimic as closely as the mockingbird does. And as we already said, the mockingbird doesn't do a, a perfect job. But the brown thrasher seems to do an even worse job. And also brown <laughs> thrashers are not as widespread. They're found just east of the Rockies right, here in North right. America and mostly much more common in the, the southeast year-round. So right, we do right. have them up here, but they're a migrant. Right. So, and also the mockingbird is mentioned in that children's song, and brown thrasher isn't. So <laughs> people just know the mockingbird's name more. Right. I think the mockingbird <laughs> is just more yeah. present. But getting back to our, the three mimids we mentioned: yeah. mockingbirds, brown thrashers, <laughs> and capers. One way you can remember this: if you hear these kind of mimicky calls, because they do sound similar, mm -hmm. um, they have a certain cadence, they have a certain sound to them. I mean, we hear catbirds a lot, especially during banding. Yeah. As I already mentioned, mockingbirds tend to repeat each phrase three to four times. Mm -hmm. Brown thrashers tend to re repeat phrases just twice. So they'll do two sounds and then two yep. different sounds, two different sounds. And catbirds seem to just do it once. Yeah. Now, these, are, of course, are not hard and fast rules. <laughs> right. But typically, that's a general rule of thumb. If you hear a mimic, you can say, okay, well, how many times is it repeating it? And start to help narrowing it down. Yeah. And these, of course, are not the only mimics we have here in North America, starlings. I didn't know starlings are mimics, but they oh. are. Hmm. And we'll talk about that. Now, mimicry was noted as early in the 1500s in England. Uh, Henry VIII had a pet African gray, African gray parrot. Okay. That mimicked human voices. And the <laughs> first scientific paper on mimicry was from 1773, showing that young linnets learned the songs of other birds. And linnets are a species of Eurasian finch. Oh, okay. And since then, uh, researchers have figured out that mimicry has been noted in about 15 to 20 percent of songbird species. Wow, that, yeah. I, that's way more than Isn't I would have crazy? guessed. Yeah. So like one in five, hmm. pretty much. Now, is that including conspecific? Because I wonder if maybe if a young bird was raised without its parents, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a group of those maybe wouldn't learn their songs because they don't have their parents. We're talking about We're going to talk about Oh, that. cool, cool. But generally, if you're talking about mimicry, Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to what we said at the very beginning, mimicry, they're really talking about other species, learning the songs oh, or vocalizations okay. of other species. Oh, so I, I think I, I made a connection that, that maybe you hadn't 
actually explicitly said before because we're t- you mentioned con specific and hetero specific so i started thinking of mimicry in that way already mm-hmm. so yeah well i'll let you get to it <laughs> all right yeah <laughs> now i want you to the, that last stat i gave you that mimicry has been noted 20 percent of songbirds yeah put a pin in that because okay. i want to take a moment to point out that it's not just birds we already heard from hoover the harbor seal yeah uh, but vocal mimicry has been heard in other mammals including orangutans bottlenose dolphins killer whales african elephants and our buddy hoover hmm. examples like this mammals mimicking human speech are exceedingly rare and it's probably due at least in part to the fact that the vocal apparatus of most animals differs so significantly from ours hmm. and because human speech is so complex yeah right but there's one example I came across, a study that came out this year in current biology. It is an example of Batesian mimicry. So what is Batesian mimicry again, just for the audience? That's as compared to Mullerian mimicry. Right. Yep. Batesian. <laughs> See, this is another one that's now it's going to be like a but you said it. a coin toss. Is, is it the, the poison one? It's when, <laughs> or when you, you try to look danger or you try to, yeah, appear dangerous to other things around you. Right. So. You're harmless, right. but you take on the appearance of something that's dangerous. Right. Like I brought up butterflies before, so I guess it would be something trying to look like a monarch because monarchs are, th- right. they have that toxicity. Yep. Yeah. And for anyone out there in the audience who's thinking like the viceroy mimics the monarch, I actually found out that that's not true. <laughs> oh, you know what? I feel like we talked about this previously, maybe. We did, yeah. and I was going to direct people, listen to our Downy Woodpecker episode, yeah. because there we talk, we delve into mimicry, Batesian right. mimicry and Mullerian mimicry a lot. Right, okay? right. And we've forgotten it by this point. So. <laughs> maybe you have. <laughs> but this is one of the first examples of acoustic Batesian mimicry. Hmm. So this researcher, they were doing, they were capturing bats, right? Hmm. And they discovered the first case of acoustic Batesian mimicry in mammals, one of the very few documented in any species. This deals with greater mouse-eared bats. They're found in Europe. And the researchers found when they were catching these bats, they would make these buzzing sounds, hmm. almost like you know an alarm or distress call. Okay. And they very much sounded like the buzzing sound of wasps. And they started to wonder, are they doing this to discourage predatory birds from eating them because they do often get preyed on by owls Hmm. so the researcher made this discovery as i said while conducting field research misnetting bats yeah and he said when we handled the bats to take them out of the net or process them they invariably buzzed like wasps so later on they played those sounds back to captive owls to see how they'd react and the owls consistently reacted both to the bat buzzes and to the wasp noises by moving farther away from the speaker oh so imagine a bat that has been seized but not killed by a predator, buzzing might deceive the predator for a fraction of a second long enough for them to fly away. God. Now, because the three study species, the owls, the bats, and the wasps, they all share many of the same spaces, like buildings, rock crevices, or caves, it's, there's likely to be plenty of opportunity for them to interact. Hmm. So that's just another example of mammals mimicking another species. Wow, that's cool. Uh, now I'm picturing the uh, the owls like um, Nicolas Cage in The Wicker Man. <laughs> not the bees, not the bees. <laughs> don't watch that movie. Watch that movie. <laughs> watch it, absolutely. Well, I got <laughs> But don't expect a good movie. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and I'll put a, a link to an article talking about that bat study because it is a fascinating read. Uh-huh. That'll be in the show notes. Okay, so the last stat I gave you about the birds was that mimicry occurs in about 15 to 20 percent of passerines. So I want to focus a little bit on what sounds that birds mimic, but why don't we walk a little bit? Yeah, and while we walk, so I know what you mean when you say passerine, uh-uh. but yeah, maybe you should explain it because I feel so, like we're, <laughs> the birder types would no, catch on. Oh, this is good, this is yeah. good. So I actually had to look this up. Uh, because oh, really? the question popped in my head, are all passerines songbirds? Well, that, I, I almost consider that the, the common name for what a passerine is, is a songbird. Right. So birds, are, of course, are in different groups. And the passerine group are the perching birds. Mm. And that's made up of one group called the ossines, and then there's the sub mm. And those are basically all songbirds. So for practical purposes, when someone uses the term passerine, they are talking about songbirds. Yeah. So, and these are perching birds. And some people, I've heard people sometimes say, oh, those are feeder birds, but not all songbirds come to feeders. Like the warblers <laughs> don't come to feeders. Yeah. And, you know, there's plenty of birds that don't come to feeders, but definitely most of the birds that come to feeders would be included. Yeah, in I think that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Feeder birds are, that's probably a good, good group of example birds. You right. know? Yeah. yeah. 
So small to medium sized. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't think of any large pass rooms. Can you? Mm, not really. No, but if there is one, I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> All right. So what sounds do birds mimic? The craziest sounds are made when birds mimic us in sounds from the environment, like the lyre bird. Yeah. But it's more usual that they mimic other animals. And it's most common that they mimic short, sharp calls. Hmm. Sounds that are often used as alarm calls. Here. Okay. So typically, as I just mentioned, we refer to passerines, the perching birds, as songbirds. But many of the sounds that the birds in this group makes, they're not really songs at all. In fact, the sounds that we hear regularly are often calls, right? Yeah. So birds' songs tend to be more complex and melodious than calls. Typically, only the males sing the songs during the nesting season because they're trying to establish their territories and attract mates. <laughs> By comparison, calls are usually short, simple sounds, and birds use them all season. Yeah. So as an example here, I'm going to play the cardinal, a bird I'm, I'm hoping most of our listeners are, are familiar with, mm -hmm. and you're going to hear the song followed by the call. So the song that you heard first, that's more melodious, and then yeah. the call are just those sharp notes, Yeah. kind of like some people call them chip notes. Mm -hmm. Among most songbirds, I didn't know this, the calls are instinctive. So the birds are born with the ability to make them. Okay. But the songs, they are learned. Oh, I didn't know that. So young birds have to hear the songs of their own species during the first few months of life. Hmm. So if it were possible for a cardinal to grow up without ever hearing its own kind, it would make its calls, those chip notes, Yeah. but it would never develop the ability to sing its species' descriptive distinctive song wow okay i didn't know that right yeah i didn't know that either wow yep so it's singing is like swiping right on <laughs> tinder right yeah. but unfortunately I, they, that they, helps you they have to they have to learn how to do it from one of those make out with chick seminars or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and if they don't go to that that's, aka growing up in their first few months of life that they learn from their parents <laughs> <laughs> yeah that doesn't I, that's kind of creepy let's yeah. not use that analogy <laughs> <laughs> no i'm using it <laughs> all right so now we're going to get into why do birds do this now hmm. we, we joked a little bit about it before but why do you think birds do this why do they mimic other species the mockingbird the brown thrasher what's yeah, going yeah. on there i don't know i, I almost so I don't know. Now I'm wondering. I'm like, do some of them just do it to do it? Like, do you know, like people just repeat stuff that they hear? I wonder. I, if, I do know about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I I wonder if birds are also just doing that too at a certain point. But that's that's gonna be my guess. And let's see how wrong or right I am. You know what? It's funny because I think we've both been doing this long enough. Yeah. <laughs> to, to realize that's probably the best. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get to that they're just too dumb not to mimic <laughs> things no <laughs> as we often learn when we tackle questions like this in our episodes nobody knows for sure there, yeah. there's no definite concrete answer there's lots of ideas out there right right uh, and, and that's not to say there isn't concrete answers in science like right there is for sure it's just some of these questions when we're talking about like behavioral things and all that it's hard to because we're not in the heads of these animals it's, it's, not. it's tough to give definitive answers but that doesn't say there's not evidence for one way or another so in yeah. referring to that bat study we i when i presented that i kind of made it seem like they're saying these bats are mimicking the wasps to yeah. deter the owls and that's definitely what's happening right right that's a hypothesis right and honestly i think it's the wasps that <laughs> are mimicking <laughs> the, the bats, bats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to scare the owls because right. then they sound like bats <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> so i definitely should have presented that more as this is what we think may be going on and there's going to sure. have to be a lot more research before we can say with any layer of certainty right, level right. of certainty that that's what's happening but it's fun to go over the ideas, and that's what we're going to do yeah. here. So first, we're going to talk about the functional hypotheses. Like, they're mimicking for a reason, and we think these might be the reasons, or this might be the reason. Okay. And I should preface this by saying that there's probably not going to be one overall reason. It may, It's most likely, if there is a specific reason, it's going to differ between species yeah. or groups yeah. of animals. Mm -hmm. It would be very difficult to say, animals mimic other species for this reason. Right, right. right. So let's first talk about the intraspecific functions. What is intraspecific? Oh God, I always forget inter versus intra. I guess intro would be between species? Inter. Inter is between species, yes. okay. See, I, I always get it switched Just in my head. Just remember, intramurals. 
that's when you're playing sports against people in your own school. Right. right? I did play intramural. Wait, intramural? Yes. Basketball. Yes. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't good enough for the team, but. <laughs> All right. So intramural functions. They imitation is a way to increase song complexity and more complex singing may help males score. <laughs> okay. How dare you? <laughs> I know I was talking about Tinder before, but I have to act appalled. So, <laughs> so it's, it seems like the, the most popular hypotheses have to do with mating and that this is probably a reproductive strategy to yeah. help the males get some. Okay? Mm-hmm. So here are the, the most common hypotheses. Number one is to attract mates. So in some songbird species, the data suggests Females seem to prefer males that sing multiple or varied songs. Hmm. And again, that's in some. Yeah. A male that can use mimicry to increase his repertoire may attract more females. We think that's what's going on with the lyrebird. We think that's maybe what will be going on with the mockingbird. Hmm. And this appears to explain the use of mimicry by male satin bowerbirds. This is another Australian species. Have you ever seen these guys? Bowerbirds? I, I know I've seen them because I've heard of them before, but it's been a while. They're so different I don't know. kinds of bowerbirds, but this one, it's about crow sized. It's purplish blue. Okay. And it has a pale bill. It's almost white and has this bright violet eye. They're hmm. super striking birds. Yeah. And they're called the bowerbirds because, like the lyrebird, they kind of clear an area, but yeah. then they build this crazy bower. It's like an arch or like a U shaped. A structure out of oh, sticks. Okay. And then yeah. they pepper the ground around it with different objects they find. They could yeah, be yeah. human objects or flowers. Whoa. They just decorate this crazy looking stage. Yeah. And that's where they do their courtship display. Are they related? Are these those like uh, either Australian or New Zealand like bird of paradise birds or? I don't know if they're related to birds of paradise. Yeah, I, can't, yeah. I don't we'll know. We'll put either. that in the, the episode notes. I don't think so. Okay. Just looking at their like size and shape. Okay. Because as I said, a bower bird is more like crow shaped. Okay. It's not related to crows, but. Okay. So males with the bower birds, males with larger mimetic repertoires, mate with more females than males with smaller rep- repertoires. Hmm. And it also seems that females pay attention not just to the diversity of the sounds produced, but also the accuracy. Oh, okay. And then we're talking about bowerbirds here. Males that produce more accurate mimicry get to mate with more females than those with less accurate. So one theory is that possessing a diverse assortment of songs may indicate to a female that the individual is an older male with proven longevity and survival skills. And those are traits you're going to want to pass on to your offspring. Yeah, okay. I, I guess. Yeah. So with certain species, the mimicry may have to do with attracting mates. That's hmm. what it seems to be about. Hmm. So another hypothesis is that the mimicry may be there to help the males better acquire and defend territories. There was a study in Texas that found northern mockingbirds with the best repertoires had the territories with the best resources, the most insects, grapes, and persimmons. These were in these specific habitats. Okay. And those two things, attracting mates, better acquiring and defending territories, they may be happening together. Yeah. They may be happening separately. Hmm. It's it's tough to say at this point. Right. There's even another, a third hypothesis relating to reproductive strategies that is saying that mimicry has to do with stimulating mates to bring them into reproductive condition. There was a study in 2014 in the Journal of Avon Biology that sampled songs of northern mockingbirds throughout the year, two times during the breeding season and once during the non-breeding season. Results showed that there were significant differences across seasons in the frequency, but not the diversity of mimicry. So they're always Hmm. mimicking the same amount of birds, but they weren't mimicking as often. Because remember, a mockingbird can just give a a regular mockingbird call or it can pepper in the songs of other birds. These mockingbirds mimic most in late spring and least during the non-breeding season, Hmm. suggesting that mimicry might play a role in reproductive stimulation of multiple brooded females. Hmm. So females that have more than one group of young during the breeding season. Because mockingbirds mimicked summer migrants throughout the year, regardless of whether they were even present, mimicry is unlikely to be about communicating between species. Okay, because we're going to get into some ideas about some people say, well, no, it has to do with mockingbirds are trying to communicate to other species. Okay. And we'll talk about why. Yeah. But they're saying since they were mimicking these mimics throughout the year, whether they are migrants, whether they were present or not, it probably doesn't have to do with communicating between species, right. interspecies communication. Right, right. So those seasonal patterns, they also suggest females might be attracted to a high frequency of mimicry but not a high diversity of mimicry because they're not changing the amount of birds that are mimicking. Yeah. So again, this is just mockingbirds. Right, right. But then I also 
when, when I think of that, I also wonder why couldn't it be doing both? So it, when they're around those other species, it does communicate to them, but when they're not, it also, maybe they just do it anyway, but it has more of a benefit when they're around those other species. True. Right. I, yeah. So there's all these questions that, you know, researchers have to ask. Yeah. So people are still actively studying this, trying to figure this out. Mm. So at least with mockingbirds, with those satin bowerbirds we talked about, it does seem that mimicry is has something to do with reproduction, attracting hmm. mates, because it does seem the males with the larger repertoires do mate more often hmm. you know, and okay. have better territories. Yeah. So those are the intraspecific functions, attracting mates, better acquiring and defending territories, and stimulating mates to bring them into reproductive condition. Now we're hmm. going to talk about the interspecific functions. Okay. All right. So dealing between species. So there's the question, do birds imitate competing species to deceive them into avoiding their territory? Because say you're a robin yeah. and you hear a robin, yeah. you're like, oh, I'm not going to go over there. Somebody's already there. Right, right. But it's actually a mockingbird. That study I mentioned earlier from Texas found that their results didn't support the hypothesis, hmm. at least in mockingbirds. Yeah. Other story, studies I looked at seemed to concur. There was one study that was in the condor and it gauged the response of Florida scrub jays to mimic calls. We're gonna, but have you ever seen a Florida scrub jay? I have, yeah. So th they look like a blue jay. but No no crest. No yeah. crest, and they're just blue on their head, right? They have some grays too, don't on they? On the, their back and then like their tail. Th they're not as nice looking for sure as blue jays, yeah. <laughs> Again, that's a judgment call. <laughs> <laughs> they're ugly. <laughs> <laughs> they look like a blue jay on vacation. Objectively, <laughs> on vacation. <laughs> so what the researchers did here is they played some different kinds of calls. They played mockingbird imitating a Florida scrub jay call. Mm -hmm. Then they played actual scrub jay calls. And then they played blue jay calls embedded within a mockingbird song. Hmm. And then just a regular mockingbird song. What they were trying to find out is do they respond differently to a mimicked call, mm -hmm. an actual call from another Florida scrub jay? Yeah. If the call's kind of within a mimicked series, mm -hmm. or if it's just a regular mockingbird, what are they gonna respond to? Because Folks, very often, I shouldn't assume that everybody knows this, if a bird hears another bird of the same species, a conspecific, yeah. it often, that can be an aggressive thing. Right, it's right. saying like, I'm here, don't come here, this <laughs> is my territory. So what they found is that the Florida scrub jays responded to the recording of their own species, mm -hmm. but they were not fooled hmm. by any of the, the mockingbird, whether the mockingbird it was just doing the Florida scrub jay call, whether that call was within a larger mockingbird song or even just the mockingbird song by itself, the Florida scrub jays didn't seem to react. Interesting, okay. And, so, and we, we already said that the mockingbird mimics are a little bit off, so. Yes, they're usually a little bit off. Yeah. But even when they're good, they don't seem to deceive the other yeah. species. Right. They're like, nice try, but. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No. But even if another species is unlikely to be deceived by a mimicked song, it may learn to associate mimic song with an aggressive mimic mm, okay so right. they were trying to look at that in that earlier study i mentioned because yeah. maybe it's not that the birds are being tricked maybe they're just like oh there's a, a bird over there that mimics a lot of other birds and it's kind of right. aggressive i'm going to stay away right and i'm just thinking like imagine i'm hiking somewhere and then suddenly i hear someone like pretending to be you off in the <laughs> distance like hey steve come over here near this bush i'd be like nah. i'm getting out of here <laughs> yeah that almost sounds like Bill that Bank. sounds like an aggressive mimic <laughs> and <a> great analogy <laughs> so one study looked at great tits and blue tits these are chickadee relatives steve uh, shaking his head yeah i'm mature here <laughs> I mentally lost the script for a second. I was like, where is he going with this? All, you know, all in a split second. But these birds do look something like chickadees. They are related. Yeah. So when great tits and blue tits compete for food and nesting during the breeding season, great tits mimic blue tit songs. Hmm. So matching, as I already said, matching another's individual song is often used to signal aggression between birds of the same species. So it's, it seems possible that the mimicking great tits are attempting to intimidate the blue tits. You know It'd be I mean? funny that it comes down to it and they're act, they're just mocking the other species like, ah, look it, I'm a blue tit. <laughs> <laughs> now, we kind of touched on the, the next hypothesis a little earlier, predator defense. Uh -huh. There's a few ideas within here. So one of them is mimicking may be an effort to induce mobbing. So there's a bird mm. in, in Asia called Greater Racket-Tailed Drongo. These birds, they're, they're kind of a bluish purple, and mm. from their outer two tail feathers, they have these long strands with these racket-shaped feathers on the end. So when they fly, okay. these two 
long appendages are trailing from their uh, their tails. I was about to say, I, I don't think I've ever heard of this, and the name doesn't sound familiar at all, but I wonder if this is one of those ones that's come up in examples of like runaway selection, because sometimes when you have the sexual selection that, yes. that, that selects for these really wild traits, like these crazy long tail feathers, right. that actually may hurt its chances of survival, potentially, I don't know in the case of this bird, but so maybe I have seen it, because it yeah. sounds familiar, but maybe there's a number of species with a, a similar picture, thing. If you saw a picture, you'd be like, oh yeah, I think I yeah. saw that before. And a lot of those species that you mentioned that have these extreme body parts for sexual selection, yeah. they often exist in areas where resources are abundant. So mm-hmm. don't have to worry so much about finding food. Okay. So these racket-tailed drongos, they mimic alarm and mobbing calls of other species <laughs> alongside their own alarm vocalizations. So it's possible they're doing so to enlist other species to their aid. Oh, okay. Here, if you have one thing that we do when we're out birding sometimes is we'll play a mobbing call where it's a lot of chickadees calling. Yeah, yeah. And that brings in a lot of other birds. (laughs) It seems like everyone wants to defend the chickadee. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They're like, protect this man, you know, and they all come in and... (laughs) But what's really going on? Just for the audience. Sure, sure, sure. What is really going on when that happens? Honestly, I, I actually don't know. All I know is that the chickadees, the thing is chickadees tend to, to flock with other species too. Well, we think there's safety in numbers. Yeah, yeah. Right? And but, also... but, but sometimes you'll get something like, we think of cedar waxwings. They also flock with a number of other individuals, but that's usually of their own species, right? They're right. pretty gregarious. They fly in groups. But with chickadees, it's mixed groups. And I know other species do this too, but... But we're talking not just about flocking behavior. We're talking about when there's a predator right. or the... some kind of danger and yeah. they mob. Right. But there's probably safety in numbers, but also if you're a prey species, you want to know where the predator is. At least that's what we think, is mm-hmm. they're trying to know, okay, the predator's there. I want to be aware of it is so I can hopefully okay. avoid it. Right, right. So if something else sees the predator, you also want to be able to see the predator. Right. You want if to know if it's it is. calling, you want to make sure it's not hidden from you. Yeah. So these drongos, they're mimicking other birds' alarm calls. Okay. Maybe to bring them in, but there's not much evidence for this. Hmm. The most compelling evidence came from a single experiment in which researchers played a recording of phenopeplas. This is a bird in our the Southwest. Yeah, American like Southwest. Mexico and, and yeah. the American it looks like Southwest. A, yeah, a cedar waxwing that's all black. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, yeah. this is one of those birds that I've been thinking about for years and years and years, but I've never seen it. But it's it, it's such wild. a cool. Yeah, I've never seen it. Well, no, I haven't seen it in the wild or, well, you're right. I've seen pictures of it. I thought you were saying like in a zoo, and I'm like, <laughs> I've never seen it in a zoo. I don't think so anyway. But yeah, yeah, this is one that I've been wanting to see for a long time. And it's one of those ones that, even though I've never seen it, the name stuck with me and the visual of it stuck with me. Right, Spanopepla, that's an interesting name. Mm -hmm. So in this study, the researchers played a recording of Phanopeplas mimicking alarm calls of other species, along with giving their own alarm calls, and it did result in other species mobbing a predator decoy. Hmm. So that's the most compelling evidence for that. And keep in mind, though, they're using recordings, they're using a decoy, so this is definitely not completely natural Hmm. circumstances okay there's also some idea dealing with predator defense that spotted bowerbirds mimic predators and aggressive species to avoid being eaten Hmm. so they're going to mimic a predator and this is batesian mimicry yeah to try to discourage other predators okay if you're a predator and you hear another predator close by you may go away the predator of my predator is my friend (laughs) (laughs) exactly yeah (laughs) they may also use this to use this behavior to frighten off competitors for resources. Okay. okay. But again, folks, for all of these kind of predator-related hypotheses, there exists very little experimental support. Hmm. Okay. All right. So before we get to what seems to be the idea that has the most support, mm-hmm. we need to talk about our sponsor. Yeah. So Gumleaf USA makes high-quality, super comfortable, handmade tall rubber boots. They're handcrafted for comfort and function. And honestly, I really do like the, the way they look, despite not wearing them right now. It's kind of a, I was about to say, it's kind of a warm day for boots, but I don't think I ever feel like I get too warm in them anyway, so. No, and it's dry, yeah. so oh, yeah. this is not a boots day. Yeah, but even if it wasn't dry, they're 100% waterproof, <laughs> durable, and made with 85% natural rubber, so you won't have to worry about them cracking. They have styles for men and women, and they're great for birding, botanizing, or any other outdoor activity. So if you're interested in high quality tall rubber boots, we recommend visiting gumleafusa.com and exploring their products. It's also a great way to support us and it'll help us do cooler things with the podcast in the future. So uh, look for a link in the episode notes and on our website. And patrons of the podcast do get free shipping. So all you have to do is go to our Patreon page 
and we have it we have the code for it locked away so yeah. if you're a patron you have access to yeah. the code for patronize only <laughs> yeah and i do have to say that within the past month or so we were out somewhere my wife and i and she was wearing her gum leaf boots mm. and she just happened to say off the cuff that she was happy with them because they're for women and she felt that they were attractive enough where she didn't feel self-conscious wearing the boots out in public mm, <laughs> nice yeah. <laughs> yeah thought that was good all right so she's trying to attract other people <laughs> when you guys are out <laughs> wow wow yeah I'm yeah <laughs> Whatever you guys are into, though, no, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's not what's happening. Oh, okay, okay. Because <laughs> I know she's going to listen to it. <laughs> All right, so back to our final hypotheses. Now, maybe because some mim- mimicry is so accurate, it's tempting to think that it's produced for a specific reason. But if a reason exists for most species, it's been surprisingly hard to pin down. Mm. At least, a, well, because we, we've talked about a few cases where it seems like it looks like at least for this species it's happening right. or this species. But, but for but most species, it's hard to no. hard for a unifying yeah. idea. And yeah. as I said, 15 to 20 percent of songbirds mimic on some level. Yeah. So we're talking about the mockingbird, the lyrebird. Those are specific species. Yeah. Just a drop in the bucket compared to the number of species that do mimic. And one thing I do wonder is, is that there's so many species that mimic. I wonder if this is an ancestral trait. Right. that was lost in 70% of species, or if this is a convergent trait that independently popped up in a number of different lineages. Right, you can I look don't know. that up. Yeah, I've, I, I wonder if people have, I'm sure it's been thought about. At least people, I'm sure, have done a, um, you can plot traits on a, on a tree and then see what's the most parsimonious. I, I, I wonder, yeah. yeah. Hmm. That's a future PhD study. <laughs> sure, sure. Or already current and, or <laughs> oh, whatever, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so regardless, there's not a lot of compelling data for most hypotheses. The explanation with the least immediate appeal is one suggested to explain mimicry in starlings, but it does seem to be the one that has the most data. Starlings tend to mimic short, simple sounds that are abundant in their environment. And it appears from their repertoire of of sounds that they mimic that they don't select particular sounds to learn, but rather just learn environmental sounds that happen a lot and are similar to their own vocalizations. So this is best explained by the learning mistakes model. So I want to say that again, mm. the learning mistakes model. This model is based on the well-accepted template model of song learning. And what this says is songbirds typically learn their species-specific songs by comparing the sounds they hear to a mental template. And they learn only the sounds that match their template. Hmm. So Man, we said that they have to learn their songs. Yeah, I was going to, it's all coming full circle. You, you designed this episode well, because as you were, like, I almost felt like I was predicting what you were about to say because you already had it set up earlier in the episode. Right. Yeah. So as species vary, and this is the important part, as species vary in the specificity of this template, some birds learn only sounds that fall within very narrow parameters. Hmm. So typically these are birds with few short stereotyped songs very specific songs and they're typically short Hmm. while others have more relaxed parameters typically birds with more complex songs the suggestion was that starlings have such a relaxed parameter template they require heterospecific songs or sounds songs from other birds by mistake Hmm. although it's difficult to test this direct directly much of the mimicry data are more consistent with this hypothesis than with data from any of the other functional hypotheses. Hmm. So there's also some experimental evidence that birds will mimic the sounds of other species if those sounds are edited to fall within the parameters of their template. So there's one study that looked at song sparrows. Song sparrows don't usually learn swamp sparrow songs, Mm -hmm. but what these researchers did is they edited the syntax of the swamp sparrow song to resemble that of the song sparrow's song. So it kind of changed the length of it. Okay. Okay. And then the song sparrows mimicked the swamps. Whoa. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. So this explanation, it's not super sexy, <laughs> but it's basically like, well, some birds, their template of, of the songs that they, they would learn is a little more relaxed. They're just hmm. picking up other songs too. I don't know. This, this is to me already sounded like the most plausible. It, well, no, it, it also sounds fun too. Like, a because it definitely um, fits with other parts of their biology. You know what I mean? It, right. yeah, it's, I mean, I like this one the most so far, but obviously 
we're not saying it's true, but right. I, it, I just happen to like this one. But then again, you're talking to the guy who also liked the why humans are naked apes because of the parasite <laughs> hypothesis. Like, I, I like that one a lot, too, and uh, I don't think people take that too seriously. So. No, that's yeah. a shout-out to the Tick episode. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the learning mistakes model. And, and mm-hmm. remember, folks, it's probably not going to be one overarching reason that, I mean, we'll eventually figure this out, I think, or sure. at least get closer I mean, to figuring the it out. The fact that birds learn their songs though that's such a that's such a strong prerequisite to mimicking songs right like you you feel like that's like the mechanism's already there for them to learn stuff mm-hmm. yeah sense, i mean right? it just seems like a it, every it, the pieces kind of fall together it seems but who knows i'm sure a uh, a bird, bird researcher may be hopefully listening and being like oh but they don't know about this or <laughs> this you know Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> oh my god in mimicry like this yeah. episode could have been so much longer we could have done two parts yeah just folks if you give it a chance check out the wikipedia page on mimicry Mm. just all these different kinds of mimicry that happen in nature it is fascinating (laughs) because remember we're just mostly talking about birds here a few mammals yeah yeah Uh, i mean this happens at plants and insects and it's just it's crazy even ice mimics things like vases (laughs) and (laughs) (laughs) see our we have an episode on that but yeah winter phenomena or something spikes yeah ice spikes yeah. yeah now i wanted to end though with I thought this was interesting. Why is mimicry so common in captive animals? And this is actually going to circle things back to Hoover. Yeah. You mean like parrots and stuff that people... Exactly. Yeah. Right? So under natural conditions, many animals use vocalizations to form and maintain social bonds. Hmm. We do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. By copying each other's vocalizations, pairs or groups of individuals, they produce the same call or song and identifies them as part of that pair or group. Mm -hmm. So this is separate from birds making like one robin making a robin call to let another robin know that hey this is my territory yeah there's like lots it, of groups that do it socially yeah and if i went into like the american south i'd be saying like hey y'all and hee-haw and stuff because i'd want to fit in oh. and they would they would know that i'm part of their group you know so <laughs> moving on okay <laughs> i get it though i get it yeah <laughs> so they make those sounds to identify they're part of a pair or group and that's most often the case for long lived species that live in dynamic societies where individuals frequently separate and reunite. So mm. think of like elephants. When individuals of these species are isolated in captivity... Think of elephants. I feel like I get what you're saying because they, they, they travel in, so... In social groups. Yeah, they travel and, and, and live in social groups. Yep, and sometimes yeah. the groups separate and come back together. Right, right. Sometimes when these species are isolated in captivity, they may copy sounds of other animals they hear in an attempt to form social bonds hmm. like they would in the wild. So think about parrots i didn't realize this before doing this episode parrots typically do not mimic in the wild Hmm. but once they're in captivity there's no other parrots there making parrot noises yeah they hear humans so they're trying those parrots are trying to form a social bond with the critters they're hearing around them yeah so this explanation is plausible for the mimicry that's heard in captivity by a number of species that don't appear to mimic in the wild so this we mentioned bottlenose dolphins harbor seals like hoover and african elephants yeah so i'm going to put a a link into the episode notes there was a an elephant in korea that was in captivity his name was koshik and he learned five korean words and there's some great examples of him he actually sticks his trunk into his mouth to kind of manipulate his lips so (laughs) i tried to get a great example he says anyang no way (laughs) No way. So this is, guys, any Arrested Development fans yes. out there. In fact, I had all, earlier this episode, I made an Arrested Development when I said, for patronize only. That was an Arrested Development. Uh, I missed yeah. that one. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> but I so tried to get him an example of him saying that, but I just wow. couldn't get it clear enough. So, uh, Anya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so good. Which means? Hello, I it think. It means hello right? in Korean. A- at right? least that's what Arrested Development taught me. I don't know. And it's know. true. Oh, and it is true. Okay. <laughs> it is true. Yeah. So there was a researcher. He, he sounds like he's an American from who's studying from a university in Austria. He mm. went to Korea. And they interviewed him. And he said, you know, a lot of times you'll hear or see on the internet, people post videos of their dog making noises. And they say, oh, he sounds like I, he's saying I love you. <laughs> he's like, that's... Well, and the dog's just going, oh, wow, wow, wow. Right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, oh, it said I love you. Yeah. But this researcher's researcher went because he said you know the recordings we made the comparisons we we took this is the real deal like this elephant is actively mimicking he doesn't understand what the words mean sure sure but he's trying to form a social bond likely right with his trainer and this researcher had the best name his Mm. name was tecumseh fitch 
What? Like, well, that's, that is a beautiful... <laughs> yeah, I'm just happy you, you had that down, that you didn't struggle with saying it. Yeah. Great name. But I'll put a link to that article yeah. in the episode notes. One of the funny things is that you brought up the elephant putting its trunk in its mouth to be able to manipulate its mouth to be able to make those sounds. It made me instantly, in this whole episode, I've sort of been thinking it in the back of my head, where uh, we have a friend, Chuck, yes. who, who does really, really good owl impressions and, and to call owl. them in. Screech Owl specifically, he has his, some fingers in his mouth and yeah. he wiggles one. And it's, it totally made me think of the, the elephant made me think of that for sure. Yeah. yeah. That is definitely Chuck's superpower. Oh, he's amazing. He can mimic the screech owl's whinny because i know people say well yeah. i can mimic an owl i'm like no right right <laughs> <laughs> right i mean because there's a lot of people that have barred owl down and, and a number of people have screech owl but his i mean he's just so good and and the way he does it made me think of the elephant so. that's exactly right. oh yeah. it's great so similarly this vocal mimicry in wild killer whales has been documented only in a juvenile that was separated from its natal pod hmm. and as i already mentioned this may explain why mimic why parrots mimic in captivity hmm. this is essentially a learning mistakes explanation, right? Mm. Captive animals would learn conspecific vocalizations preferentially. Yeah. But in the absence of their own species, they're going to learn the heterospecifics right. of other species. Now, do you mind if I just bring something up really quick to no. sort of, not to question this whole thing, because obviously some species do it, some species don't. I immediately think of like a nest parasite, like the brown-headed cowbird. Now, it's not raised by brown-headed cowbirds. It's raised by other species. Mm -hmm. Do brown-headed cowbirds have non-mimic calls or songs? Right. Is that hardwired into them? Because I'm, I don't know if it was in some documentary I was watching, but they're like, how does a brown-headed cowbird learn to be a brown-headed cowbird? Right. And then, it, then on top of that, I think, how does it learn how to be a brown-headed cowbird that has a song? And this just might be one of that 70-plus percent of species that don't mimic. They just have these songs. Well, does that number include what, when you're learning? No, because that's not mimicking, we've decided, right? When you're learning your own species Yeah, when you're song, learning your own species, species song. Right, so I wonder, I'm trying to think of what the brown-headed cowbirds uh, It's like call. a bubbly it's like Although, a warbly, bubbly. I don't thing. know if that counts as a song or as a call. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. So yeah. we'll put. I'll look that up and we'll put hmm. something into the episode notes. But just to kind of to sum that up, since a brown-headed cowbird, as a nest parasite, often isn't raised by its own species. Yeah. It tricks other species into raising its young. Right, and then it kicks the other young out of the nest. And, often, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how do they learn? brown-headed cowbird vocalizations are they right. just is it a bird that just has a call because there are some birds that just have calls yeah, yeah. that's that's a good point i don't know because sometimes these because yeah it's got that weird bubbly yeah yeah that, well we'll see that frustrates me that i didn't think of that <laughs> <in> research <laughs> all <laughs> that's right okay so that is all i have but i do want to thank listener shannon g hmm. she is the one that a while ago asked that we do something on northern mockingbirds and mimicry in mockingbirds and that just led to this whole episode cool cool so thanks shannon for giving us that idea yeah so before we get to our uh, end of episode business i do want to share uh, one piece of mail from a listener hmm. she wants you to listen to this i think you'll like this we had been trading emails she had had a question and then i was apologizing that we haven't been releasing episodes on a monthly basis <laughs> and this is what her response as far as your podcast for what it's worth I think it's better to not have a regular schedule and to put out quality episodes. Hmm. Between YouTubers that I follow and podcasts that I listen to, sometimes I think there can be too much emphasis on a regular schedule of content, hmm. and then the content suffers in my opinion. It's like they get caught in what I see as a trap of trying to increase followers and views so that they lose what made them good in the first place. I think your schedule and the jokes about who's doing what for the podcast or why there have been some time between episodes keeps it authentic and contributes to the engaging nature of your show. That's just my humble opinion as someone who doesn't even use social media, so has no vested interest in likes, views, listens, and subscribers. I just enjoy watching, listening to, and reading interesting and often educational stuff. Cool. I mean, that is refreshing to hear. I will say we have it easier than other content creators because, uh, for example, if a YouTuber doesn't produce regular videos, they do get crushed by the algorithm where we're like something that people subscribe to on like a podcatcher. Right. So we can't get crushed like they would. <laughs> people might forget about us, but we'll still pop up in their feed when we put an episode out. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you yeah. to that listener yeah, thank for you. sharing yeah. us a word of encouragement. It helps us rationalize why it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but I mean, it, it, it was also a huge compliment as well saying, right. you know, quality material and all that. So, and honestly, I will say I was rushing to try to get this episode done by June, by yeah. the end of June. And I don't think it would have been as good of an episode hmm. because I had I gave myself a few more weeks to be like, no, I'm really going to look at some more studies cool. and get yeah. a more comprehensive view. So, a, a listener influenced the podcast. They did. Yeah. 
So I apologize to the folks that really, really want us to re release on a monthly basis, but yeah. you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. Yeah, so first and foremost, we'd like to thank our growing list of Patreon supporters. So thank you to our new patron, Lon Myers. Oh, so Lon's from the Allegheny Nature Pilgrimage. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. I thought the name might have sounded familiar. Yeah, yeah, so he actually ran the Allegheny Nature Pilgrimage this year. Oh, okay. And I was there, and I happened to go on one of his walks, and we got to talking. And, and as soon as he found out like what I do, he's like, so why aren't you leading a, a tour this year? What's going on? Why aren't you doing <laughs> <laughs> I say that kind of jokingly. But yeah, he, yeah. He was, he obviously. It's his job. He wants us to come back and, and lead a, uh, right. an, another program there. Yeah. So we also like to give a special shout out each month to our top patrons. So stick around to the end of the episode to hear Bill's daughter, Violet, share that list. And remember, if you'd like to be part of the Field Guides and read our patron list in future episodes, email us at thefieldguides at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can make a one time donation through PayPal on our website or consider becoming a patron of our show at patreon.com. You'll get access to a special patrons-only version of our episodes that include Bill sharing the episode notes. Because of support from our listeners, we've been able to keep the show free and also make cooler episodes like the one that we have coming up next. So I teased this at the beginning of the episode. A few months ago, we were contacted by the head of the entomology lab at Cornell University, and he was kind enough to take us out mothing. That was his original offer. Yeah. But then on top of that, he gave us a tour of his property, and he gave us a tour of the entomology lab. How cool was that? Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> Every single part of it was amazing. The mothing, the collections, you know, everything. So we'll be posting some images to our social media coming up. Yeah. But we have, I think the last time I looked, we have about five, six hours okay. of material <laughs> yeah. that I'm going to try to edit down. It'll probably be a, a two-part right. episode. Yeah. So it was just amazing. But, yeah. Um, watch for that coming up. And also, don't forget that we do have Field Guides merch available through our website store at thefieldguidespodcast.com. And remember, if you can't financially support the podcast, you can help out by sharing it with friends and family and by subscribing and leaving us a review on wherever you get your podcasts. So it helps spread the word and it allows us to reach a wider audience. So we'd like to thank our newest iTunes reviewers. Oh God, all right. So this is the easy one. So Rattlesnake Master and... The 69 guy 420. I saw that one. Uh, more people need names like that. He's I love cramming it. a lot in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you can always find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can always email us any ideas, criticisms, or homeopathic remedies to thefieldguides at gmail.com. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks again to Shannon G for giving us the, the idea for this episode. And remember, parents, get those kids outside. Let them get muddy. Let them get dirty. Let them flip over rocks and logs. And for those, those of you that don't have kids out there, get yourself outside too. Folks, we'll see you next time. Yeah, see you next time. And here is Violet reading this episode's top patrons. Eric, Alyssa, the Hebranks, Mary, Todd, Callie, Sean C., Rich, Jessica, Rochelle, the drunk phytologist, Orange Julian, Diane, we named the dog Indy, Ken, Jonathan A., Brandon, Quixote, Robert P., Max, Jake, Melissa in Dusty, Arizona, Celia, Kelly, Sarah, Andy, Helen, MD, Judy, Ben, Lauren, Jane, Doodle Dude 82, Gail and Mac, Cassies, Jeff, Mark V, Bruce, Esther, John W, Bethany, Rob, Hannah. Thank you, Violet. You're welcome. And thank you, patrons, for all your support. It means the world to both Steve and myself. Thanks again. Who's that? Anno. Uh, this is Anyang, who your father and I have adopted. Anyang. Uh, yes, Anyang. <laughs>